Hello there, my name is Marty Braden. Whether it was your interest or your curiosity that made you click on my video, I'm sure glad you clicked on it and you're watching it. I promise I'll do my best to make it worth your time. The information I'll be sharing today is titled Group Think or Group Selection. Before I begin, I want you to know why I'm doing these short videos. Once you know and understand the why, it'll make a lot more sense to you. Back in 2015, I retired woo and had an experience that required me to read atheist Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. While I was reading it, I found myself taking a lot of notes and it soon turned into a manuscript for a book that I later titled An Atheist Delusion, the subtitle being A Latter-day Saint's Perspective on Atheist Richard Dawkins' Anti-Theist, Anti-Christ book, The God Delusion. A little while after I published my book, I decided to set up this channel so I could do a series of short videos that covered every single argument that Richard Dawkins wrote about in his book that says God does not exist. He said the purpose of his book was to turn as many of us as he could into atheists. I researched out um, a lot of stuff and, and in doing so, I decided to write this book and do my response from my perspective. Uh, and I couldn't find a Latter-day Saint who, who did it before me, so I decided to do it. And so I published my book as a rebuttal to his arguments and sharing my perspective on why God does exist. This video you're watching now is part 89, 89 in that series of videos that I've been doing. So with that said, I'm going to pick it up where I left off last time in a subtitle called Group Selection. So let me go back to that. Group selection. Group selection theory is the idea that Darwinian selection chooses among species or other groups of individuals that have similar ways of thinking. Here's an example that Richard gives to describe what this kind of group selection, selecting or group choosing is as a theory for how it helps to form a particular religion. Here's Richard describing how it might look. A tribe with a stirringly belligerent god of battles wins wars against rival tribes whose gods urge peace and harmony. In other words, they take advantage of the weaker or less, uh, more docile folks. Or tribes with no gods at all. Warriors who unshakably believe that a martyr's death will send them straight to paradise fight bravely and willingly give up their lives. That sounds a lot like 9-11 and those suicide pilots that attacked America, doesn't it? This simply sounds like groupthink to me though. So tribes with this kind of religion are more likely to survive in their intertribal warfare, steal the conquered tribe's livestock and seize their women as concubines and so on and so on. Such successful tribes prolifically spawn daughter tribes that go off and propagate more daughter tribes all worshiping the same tribal god. The idea of a group spawning daughter groups like a beehive throwing off swarms is not implausible, by the way. End of Richard's quote. This ruminating is just one more imagined guess on Richard's pot. part. I think, that's my thoughts anyway, it actually describes how organizations like Black Lives Matters or gender ideology begin and grow. Richard then states that he is not a supporter of group selection, and that's because he says he feels it doesn't amount to a significant enough force in evolution. Again, it is always about evolution's natural selection for Richard just as it is always about God's intelligence for me. I have to ask this question here. Why is Richard even bringing in this theory of group selection? I think it's to confuse or to try to sound more, I guess, credible to his peers because other intellectuals like himself agree with the idea that religion is man-made and therefore they feel it necessary to produce what he calls plausible theories as to why men have come up with different types of religion. Who knows? It just seems odd to me to even bring it up. The truth is that it doesn't help move the percentage of probability spectrum's belief cursor one fraction closer towards the God does not exist marker. It's just a smokescreen put up by Richard so he can avoid having to admit that natural selection can't possibly be the answer to everything, which he tries to make it be. In my way of thinking, there's certainly room for postulating a theory that a super intelligent designer is behind pure religion and that the natural man has a propensity for messing things up due to their state of carnality, which includes evil designs and a desire for power. And that's so they can control other people in order to achieve their selfish desires. Here's what I'm talking about. In the Doctrine and Covenants section 121 verse 39 we read, We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority and power, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Boy, is that true. I suppose I could go into a long explanation of how religion today, with all of its many stripes, originated from just one religion, God's pure religion, which religion was first revealed to God to his prophets, beginning with Adam. 
But I'm just going to give one example of this. It's the story of Nimrod from the Old Testament, who established his own slant on God's revealed pure religion, which God revealed to Nimrod's great-grandfather Noah, who in turn taught his children on down to Nimrod. Ham was Nimrod's grandfather, and Cush was Nimrod's father. So, in just three generations' time, the pure gospel of God that was revealed to Noah, the patriarch of this family of eight, four sons and four wives, I mean, three sons and their wives and he and his wife, had degenerated into a state of apostasy with Nimrod setting up his own false religion with its own unauthorized power, authority, and organization, and Nimrod placing himself at its head and not God. After the flood, the posterity of Noah began to multiply and establish cities and kingdoms upon the face of the earth. Many of the people turned from the Lord and became wicked and defiant. In their rebellion, they began to build a great tower in the land called Babel. Because of the wickedness of the people, before they completed this tower, the Lord confounded their language and scattered them across the globe. Hugh Nibley, uh, a passed away uh, professor from BYU, very well known. He was the author of Lehi in the Desert and the World of the Jaredites, as well as the collected works of Hugh Nibley back in 1980. He continues, early Jewish and Christian traditions reported that Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, referred to as a pagan temple, in an attempt to contact heaven. Among the Jews, Nimrod's name has always been a symbol of rebellion against God and of usurped authority. He established a false priesthood and false kingship in the earth to imitate God's rule and made all men to sin. The scriptural reference to Nimrod being a mighty hunter refers not only to his ability in killing animals, but also to his use of violence to gain power over and control other people. In the book of Genesis, chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, it says this, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be mighty, uh, uh, be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter for, before the Lord. And then Joseph Smith translation says, A mighty man in the land. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erect, and Akkad, and Calneh, in the land of Shinar. Though the words are not definite, it is very likely he was a very bad man, Nibli says. His name Nimrod comes from Marad, meaning he rebelled. And the Kar Targum, Targum, Ancient Jewish translations or paraphrases of the scriptures in you know, uh, 1 Chronicles 1.10 says, Nimrod began to be a mighty man in sin, a murderer of innocent men, and a rebel before the Lord. The meaning of Nimrod is the rebel. Thus Nimrod may not be the character's name at all. It is more likely a derisive term of a type, a representative uh, a representative of a system that is epitomized in rebellion against the Creator, the one true God. Rebellion began soon after the flood as civilizations were restored. At that time, this person became very prominent and ultimately established his kingdom called Babylon. He continues, He was allegedly the first king to wear a crown. For this reason, people who knew nothing about it said that a crown came down to him from heaven. Later, the book describes how Nimrod established fire worship and idolatry. Then received instruction in divination for three years from Boanatur, the fourth son of Noah. Boanatur being born after the flood, of course. This is just one example of a person's power referred to in the Old Testament living after the global flood of Noah's day. Nimrod and his people turned from the pure gospel taught by the prophet and his prophet father, great-great-grandfather Noah. Nimrod decided to come up with his own false god and established a false religion that better served his personal desires. The Old Testament is full of such stories of apostasy and new religions springing up all across the earth. I don't want to take the time it would take to present all of them, but I decided to go ahead and share one more example of another people who fell into apostasy. As I mentioned before, the Book of Mormon is a history of such a falling away from God's revealed pure religion. It contains stories of many apostate leaders setting up their own religions and the effect this had on the people over the multi many multiple centuries of apostasy that followed. Today there are literally thousands of such strands of ancient religions, each having their own religious systems and views on the nature of the God that they worship. As I said before, such is the way of apostasy. My second example is about two groups of people coming from the prophet 
uh, Lehi's parentage, both of which fell into apostasy. One group was the Lamanites, who ultimately destroyed the other group, the Nephites. The Nephites started out as a delightsome and righteous people, but they soon became a tragic story of paradise lost, the paradise being the life and way of happiness they enjoyed by following the true and living God and his gospel's plan of happiness. My comments on people and their apostasy may not be the kind of sophisticated commentary Richard would put forth, but I think my analogy will be understood by everyone reading my book the, or watching this. The analogy is that of the chain of whispers game, or what's often called Chinese whispers. This is a game where you have a number of people making up the chain. The first person is whispered an exact pure statement by the one directing the game. The first person receiving the original pure message is then required to whisper that message to the person to their left. And this transference of the message is repeated to the left, 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 until the entire chain has received and passed the message along. The last person to receive the message then says out loud what they heard. Almost without exception, the message declared by the last person to receive it doesn't even come close to what the original message was. These are people who had no axe to grind or evil designs to change the message. Now imagine the message is a typed message on paper, or is engraven on stone, or written on papyri, and passed around a chain of people. Imagine that several of the people along the chain decided to change some of the writings before passing them along to the next person. This is how apostasy happens. Now imagine Nimrod deciding to change the pure gospel message he was taught by his father. As I have said, this altering of the pure truth is the fruit or behavior of the natural man using their unrighteous dominion. I'm going to jump to a thought that I wrote because I feel like it fits perfectly in here. It's not part of my book, but I want to share it. After reviewing Richard's so-called implausible idea called group selection, it being defined as a proposed mechanism of evolution in which natural selection acts at the level of the group instead of at the level of the individual or gene. Groupthink, on the other hand, is defined as a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. One might ask, what's an example of groupthink? An example is when a leader of a group tells everyone in the group that they need to ban all members of a particular ethnic group from joining them. And for whatever reason, the majority of the members of that group accept that decision without questioning it, and in fact go out and promote it by recruiting others to their way of thinking. The new gender ideology that our society is experiencing, even as I speak, is another example of groupthink. The need to get as many people as they can to agree with their ideology is so strong that the members of this group, the gender ideology group, demand, and I suspect in time they will even make laws that require that you and I comply with this ideology or be canceled or even punished. To me, this is simply the fruit of a society that has rejected the idea of an objective set of laws for the ideology of a subjective set of laws that are subjective, which, as I said in an earlier video, ultimately leads to chaos in that society, which is exactly what we're now seeing in multiple societies throughout the world, because everybody's opinion fits, everybody's decision fits, everybody um, has to allow the other person to disagree. There'll be, uh, if they can get a group like that, well, I don't think that's right, and I don't think that, well, my opinion is subjective, 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 ultimately leads, spirals down to chaos. In this just a so I ask you, is this just a manifestation of natural selection working in our brains, this ideology that I'm talking about? Or is it just the natural man rejecting God's laws as being objective and becoming a law unto themselves their selves or ourselves uh, subjectively? I will let you decide which of these ideas rings the most true to you. But that's the end of this video. I hope it stirred some thoughts. I want to hear what some of your thoughts are and your, your comments are welcome. Uh, please keep it kindly and keep it uh, uh, non-contentional, but as, I'll take whatever side. I'd love to respond to it. And any questions you have of me, I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. But until next time, I want to wish you continued success. Goodbye.